Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, very, uh, it's a privilege to be here, actually, uh, talking to Richard about uh, his very interesting book uh, about the president of Brazil. I think is a very uh, objective view of uh, quite one, one of the most important figures, political figures in the history of Brazil, and, and quite a controversial one. Uh, you go to Brazil, and although Lula is officially the most popular president in, in the history of Brazil, uh, reaching 70 percent of popularity of approval uh, last month, uh, you can still find lots of people who absolutely dread the idea of having Lula as president. And so it's still very uh, quite a controversial figure in a very diverse and uh, a country like Brazil is sometimes difficult to explain. And uh, uh, there are many, many issues that are uh, raised in, uh, in Richard's book about the uh, about Lula's history, about his uh, um, his uh, path to, to, to the presidency. And I would like to, 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 to start asking Richard about something that he touches in the book, which is uh, the idea of class politics. And I, I brought this with me. Have you ever seen this? <laughs> no, I haven't. This, this, is, this is the very first uh, biography of Lula, uh, written by Frei Beto in 1989, when Lula was running for, for presidency for the first time. And uh, I happened to be in the launch, and <laughs> Frei Beto wrote this to me. And uh, in 1989, basically, this little book written by Frei Beto is completely different from Richard's book, because it's a very passionate uh, a story uh, of Lula, uh, who was at, at the time it was just a, a member of the Brazilian Congress and running for presidency for the first time. And basically, what Frei Beto says in this book is that the idea of having Lula running for president in Brazil that meant that the the whole class of workers in Brazil were reaching the presidency. That was uh, Frei Beto talks clearly about a class struggle, and Lula will be the representative of this class struggle. Richard, do you think that uh, if we look back to, to what Lula has reached so far and what Lula means to Brazilian history, does he mean that, uh, does his history, uh, his story, mean that uh, the class of workers in Brazil have reached power in Brazil? Well, hello, everybody, and thanks for inviting me along this evening, and thanks to you, Rogério, for um, hosting this discussion. I think the whole issue of class in Brazil is a, an extremely interesting one, um, and uh, plainly there are uh, there's, there's a well-established and historical uh, upper class, uh, both uh, an industrial upper class and uh, a semi-feudal agricultural upper class. And then there's an extremely large um, uh, poor and underclass. Um, and I think one of the interesting things with Lula was that he decided um, around about 1980 that there was scope for uh, a workers' party based on the industrial workers with which he had led and with which he was familiar, uh, his friends running other unions, sindicatus, um, uh, ranging from bank workers, his own w metal workers, uh, and so on. And this was a controversial move uh, for Brazil because the Brazilian political system was not very tuned up to class politics. It, um, uh, the, the sort of liberal intellectual uh, opposition to the military dictatorship was um, fairly hostile, but there was a hostility on the extreme left as well, uh, particularly from the old Communist Party. I quote in my book one of the people who said, um, uh, we've already got uh, a workers' party, and it was founded in 1922, uh, the old um, <coughs> Partido Comunista de Brazil, which subsequently uh, broke up. So. Um, by establishing a class-based party built around the industrial workers, who of course were a minority in Brazil. I mean, um, uh, although uh, there had been a boom with the um, economic boom in the 70s, uh, 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 led by the dictator, encouraged by the dictatorship, uh, and um, motor factories and other things had, had done quite well, 
nonetheless, the sort of unionized workers were a, a relatively small but increasingly self-confident group. And it was they, really, who led the campaign against the dictatorship uh, and brought it down by degrees. It, was, it didn't all happen quickly. So I think that um, in Brazilian history, um, Lula does represent something um, special in that he made, to begin with anyway, the PT um, a, as a class-based party something new in Brazilian politics. The question which I also had to discuss in this book, uh, while recognizing the achievements of the 1980s, was how far has all that been sort of sold out or compromised uh, by events in the 1990s and most recently in the last decade? And of course, there, um, uh, there's a big question mark over Lula. Um, it's not uh, to say that he has done nothing for working people or the poor, and I will come on in a moment to say that I think he's tried to do quite a lot of people who are, are black or dark brown in, in physical appearance. But um, he certainly uh, made some compromises. I think uh, my conclusion in this book is that having been defeated in running for presidency three times, having offered his party a ch chance to find another uh, candidate if they so wished, and they didn't, um, he resolved really to make more or less any compromise that was necessary to win. Uh, in my book, I refer to the fact uh, that was fairly well um, proven by pollsters in the 1990s, that there was a third of the population, a third of the voters who were very keen on Lula, saw him as a radical who had transformed Brazil uh, and, in, in a way, attached their dreams to Lula. A third, as Rogério who said, and this is still the case, who were bitterly hostile to him, uh, saw him as destroying um, uh, what their view of Brazil was all about, destroying their status and advantages, and a third in the middle. And the trick that he decided to go for with the aid of uh, marketing men, etc., was to try and get that third in the middle to back him. And he was successful. Now, the question therefore is, how far is the Pete of 2008 like the Pete of the early 80s, the idealistic Pete that was primarily concerned for the workers? Now, uh, he, there's still plenty of talk of solidarity. Uh, there's plenty of talk of uh, uh, wanting to um, uh, recognize the, um, the force of uh, industrial workers, and Lula makes a practice of starting and ending his campaigns uh, in the district of the industrial district of Sao Paulo, where he himself uh, made his career. But I think my own assessment would be that the compromises um, that were made to win election, uh, and there's the whole complicated system of the uh, Br Brazilian uh, political scene, which we may come on to later, but that has diminished uh, the, some aspects of the radicalism of the Pete. Not all, by any manner of means, but some of them. Um, and just before moving on to the issue of race and color, I would say that in 2006, it was clearly the votes of poorer Brazilians that achieved uh, his win in the second round uh, so that he could be re-elected as president. Uh, there's very clear evidence of this in terms of the parts of Brazil that supported him and the, um, uh, and the uh, demographic uh, involved there. Now, I couldn't complete the, the comment about class without also dealing with race because clearly there's a very uh, close uh, relationship here. On the whole, if you're a blacker Brazilian, you're a poorer Brazilian. Uh, you're either um, working in a less well-paid job or you may be in that informal economy, which large numbers of Brazilians uh, are in. Now, there's no doubt at all in my mind that one of the really good things of the Lula government has been uh, its effort to um, assist uh, black uh, Brazilians, um, and this has been done in a multitude of ways. It's not totally original. It had been started by, by the predecessor government of Cardoso, but I think um, there's been progress. 
in areas ranging from uh, university entry to um, the impact of the Bolsa Familia, the um, uh, family grant scheme, uh, which was also linked to school attendance. Uh, and which by the time he was running for re-election, something like 11 to 12 million uh, families were involved in. So um, I would give him much credit uh, for that. But on the issue of the longer-term status of the PT as a class-based party, it was never a wholly class-based party. Um, there were always intellectuals, people like Eduardo Suplicy uh, and others um, uh, from the uh, progressive middle classes, academics and so forth, who are part of that uh, coalition. And again, um, I should say, stress that the Pete in its origin was, and to this day, is a coalition. There were Catholic radicals, there were Trotskyists, uh, there were uh, people who didn't have any very strong ideological commitment, but who were uh, out of the union movement. In a way, that was Lula's own situation. Roger. It's it's interesting that you know um, when you talk about the poor people uh, uh, giving Lula the second the second term because if we go back to 1989 for example the first time that he tried the presidency he lost uh, at the the election against Collor de Mello because Collor de Mello was uh, taken to the presidency by the very same people who gave Lula his victories by the poor people from the Northeast. And this issue of race is, is something that Lula, as a candidate, that he, he suffered from in, in the debates against Kohler. I remember the, one, one of the debates between Kohler and Lula. And Lula said something like, uh, the, the people from the Northeast, they suffer so much. They don't have you know, the, the, uh, proper food and, uh, when they're, the, uh, since they're young. And, uh, and he said, well, you know, this situation is leading the, the Northeasterns to a situation in which they are almost like a subclass. Uh, a sub-race, sorry, a sub-race. And then Color Gemello, who was born in the South, but at the time was governor of the state of Alagoas in the Northeast, he said, he's calling us a sub-race. We're not a sub-race. And Lula was a Northeastern himself and couldn't react to that. And, 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 and Cola played the, the card of race and being from the Northeast. Uh, uh, but, but then Lula, in this transformation that you described, that, you know, that the, the party kind of transformed itself and he transformed, transformed himself, uh, basically Lula was just staying away from, from the Workers' Party, this very same party that he created. He basically, uh, especially for 2002, for getting prepared for 2002, he got, he got away from the party. In, in the 80s, there was no Lulistas or Lulis. There were, there were, everybody was a Petista. You know, it was the party was more important than Lula, mm. and then Lula became more important yeah. than the party. Do you think that, in a sense, because of the fact that Lula is now much more clearly much more important than the party, and the Workers' Party just had to follow Lula, do you think that Lula perhaps might have done some damage to political uh, 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 the political party system, to, to the democracy in, in Brazil, being such a personalist, you know, character? Yes, um, the very first book I wrote, which was a very long time ago, in the late 1960s, was called Political Leaders of Latin America, and it was a pelican. And I used this word personalism and personalist, and I was taken to task bitterly by an academic from Oxford who said this is very poor uh, analysis here, you shouldn't describe people as but, but actually I felt it described a number of Latin American uh, political figures uh, at the time, and indeed since. I think that um, uh, there's no doubt at all uh, that um, uh, Lula is far bigger than the Pete, and he ignores the Pete when he feels like it. And I think you're right that in that respect, he has done less to institutionalize the Brazilian democratic system uh, after 1988, 1989 than he could have done. I mean, what we've got now is a situation where there are basically four large-ish parties which have only modest ideological differences, um, because the Pete is no longer the idealistic force that it was in the early 1980s. Alongside that is the um, uh, PSDB, the party of Cardoso, uh, which is, um, I suppose, more in favor of privatization, uh, the liberal economics, which are now getting out of fashion. 
um, and uh, uh, is quite strong in a number of states. The third major force is the um, Pyramidi Bay, which uh, emerged from the constitutional opposition to the dictatorship, and which is nowadays really just a collection of regional fiefdoms. Uh, one of the things one has to remember about Brazil is that it is a complex federation. The president has a lot of power, but he's not all powerful. State governors are very important, they have their own patronage systems, and mayors uh, are very important too, they have their own patronage systems. And then the fourth of the, the large uh, parties are now called Democrats, uh, they used to be Pefeli, uh, and they represent the most conservative groups, uh, but um, they also played a part within the system in ending the dictatorship in the uh, activities in Congress. Now, I think it was open to um, Lula to play more of a role in um, institutionalizing a stronger political system. But one of his great failings, in my view, was after his election in two th for the 2002, um, instead of going for the sort of big battalions, and I think at that point, in addition to Peite, he could have got the Pyramidi Bay on his side, and they're now an important part of his coalition. Um, instead, he chose to go for all these little parties. Now, in the Brazilian system, um, it's very possible. Basically, if you're a single person, you've got plenty of money, you can get yourself elected, and you can get a few friends elected, and you become a, what is known as a partido nanico, basically tiny party, totally venal, you're out for the pork barrel for your, yourself, your friends, your little district. And um, he uh, ignored the advice of his sort of chief of staff at that time, a man named Diaseu, who said, go for the big battalions and we can build a solid majority. Uh, instead, he decided to go for all these little people um, who, in a way, he could manipulate. Um, but out of that came the scandal of, um, which is discussed in the book, uh, the corrupt, major con corruption scandal of 2005, when it was revealed that a large number of members of Congress were on a pay uh, deal with the government or with the Peite, uh, which was called the Mensalão, the monthly pay deal. And um, I think, in a way, he'd sort of fallen into a, a trap. And had he been more loyal to the Peite and perhaps put more effort into institutionalizing and building the Peite, um, then he would have made a bigger contribution to, to Brazilian democracy. As it is, as you say, he stands you know, with his 70% approval ratings rather above the battle uh, and um, uh, as, a, as a father of the poor. Personally, uh, one might get a sense from, from reading your book, and, and because you, you talk a lot, a lot about the persistency Lula trying to get to the presidency, having to really, no, I have to win now, you know, I, mm. I, and as, as you rightly said, he would do anything to, any kind of a, a, a alliances in order to, to be elected when he, he was trying for, for the fourth time. Um, and one really get a sense that uh, until he was finally elected, he was the unluckiest uh, political figure in the Bra Brazilian history, because in, in 1989, he, he could have won, he should have won if, you know, if dirty political tricks from the part of Collor, if, if the fear was not that, I mean, he was close to, uh, if he had done well in the debate and global uh, uh, people say that played a part in a way, but he was very close. And then in 94, three, four months before the election, everybody thought that Lula would win in the first round, and then he lost in the first round because the real plan came and it was completely... It worked. It, yeah, it worked and it was something that Lula didn't know how to react to. And then, so it was just being delayed. Really. So he, he said to himself, I have to win this time. Uh, do, you, do you think that Lula has, uh, throughout his career, has been driven by this personal desire to be uh, 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 recognized as, as as someone important to, to you know to make history himself uh, adapting to all sorts of situations but you know from he 
the very early stages as, 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 a, as a union leader, do you think that actually it was, as you say, the love for the limelight or wanting to be recognized? Or, want, or, 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 do, or do you think that Lula really had a plan from the very beginning to, you know, to really uh, uh, make the lives of millions of people, poor people in Brazil, uh, uh, to give them a better life? Do you think it was more like a personal thing? I mean, you went the books saying that, you know, his strife is personal. But, or do you think that there was a plan from the very beginning? Do you, do you get the sense that there was? I don't think he was a planner, and I don't think he's a planner today. Um, but I think he's a man of very strong instincts, and I think um, his own experience um, in the Northeast, arriving in uh, Sao Paulo uh, as a poor kid, um, you know, uh, selling stuff on the streets, etc., I think that did give him a very strong um, empathy with other poor people and a feeling that something had to be done about it. But I think it was fairly unideological. And um, I'm, I'm not a great sort of uh, psych psychoanalyst. I'm not uh, sort of uh, reading lots of stuff into his, um, uh, his own background. But basically, he didn't like his father. Uh, he worshipped his mother, and his mother was quite soft on him. And um, the, uh, he did have a lot of impetus. I think his career demonstrates what they say about a lot of Northeasterners, that they're, you know, they have a lot of stamina. And I think he had uh, much stamina. At various points, he could have given up or could have said, you know, I've done my best and um, it's time for somebody else to have a try. But he didn't. He kept on going. Uh, now, I think he also did have a view that it would be not just a personal triumph, but a, a, a triumph for a, a large group of people if um, a worker could become a president. That was something that did bust open the rather uh, top-down kind of history in Brazil. The only uh, previous sort of leftist president, Goulart, had actually been a landowner down in the south. He was a rich man. Uh, he was not a poor man at all. But Lula was different. You know, he'd lost a little finger in a factory accident. Uh, he'd known hunger and poverty himself. He'd moved from shack to shack as a child. Um, and, you know, I think he did feel that this was um, uh, good for Brazilians other than just himself. Uh, but yes, I mean, I think that there's, in Brazil they have this concept of the Mosca Azul, the little black, little blue fly of ambition. Which, uh, um, and I think he certainly had that. But it, it happened, in my view, quite gradually. Um, you know, as a teenager, all he was interested in was football and girls, like most Brazilian young lads. And it, it was sort of slightly fluky that he got involved in um, union politics. And to begin with, he was shy about speaking, he needed his speeches written for him. And it was sort of the, the major strikes and his own courage at that time um, against the dictatorship, which made him a national figure. Um, I think one of the things that Rogério was saying, and I, I very much agree with, is that he was dished uh, at his most radical in 1989, um, really by the power of the media. I mean, in a media audience, one should stress this, um, uh, particularly the global group who decided to pick up this um, chap from the Northeast who uh, was, as things turned out, um, uh, not a very capable and rather a corrupt figure, um, and make him, he was very good looking. I can remember my late mother saying, you know, if I was young and Brazilian, I would vote for him. He's just so good looking, <laughs> which I'm sure a lot of uh, Brazilian women felt the same. Uh, and he was boosted. You know, the capacity for boosterism of uh, the big media operators in Brazil, especially the Globo Group with its newspaper, its television and radio. I, when I first went to Brazil in 1965, I thought Globo was a crummy paper. It was a sort of another Brazilian evening, uh, another Rio evening paper. They took their international news from the Daily Express of Lord Beaverbrook. And generally, I thought it was just not much good. But amazingly, it, it sort of bestrides the media um, world in Brazil. And there's no doubt in my mind that the way in which they came in, plus some mistakes of, of Lula, plus a very successful smear campaign, dished him in 1989. You, you, you mentioned the media. Um, 
and it's very debatable, I guess, you know, how powerful the media is in terms of uh, uh, imposing uh, their will, especially in today's Brazil, because Lula was attacked by, you know, from all sides in, in, in the, the last election, 2006, and many people thought that even he could even be impeached before the election. Mm -hmm. Not only he wasn't, but he, he won and he went to the second round, but, 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 but he did win in the end. Uh, but the, Lula's relationship with the press has always been very difficult from the, the early stages. Uh, uh, Ricardo Cocho, in, in his book, mm -hmm. he talks about when, as a reporter, when he first went to, to uh, uh, the region of uh, ABC to cover Lula. Lula didn't like reporters, he didn't like the press, he didn't like the media. Um, and as president, he has been criticized mm -hmm. by all kinds of people, especially journalists, for not being a democratic, open, transparent president. He, in four years, he gave one press conference, uh, so he doesn't like that. He, he likes a straight relationship with the public, not through uh, uh, the media. Uh, do you think that is something that, in a way, has protected Lula, and Lula has achieved a lot because, actually, he, cho he chose to have this direct relationship with the public? Or, or this is something that actually went against him or and against his legacy as well, because many people still argue that he's not as that democratic because basically he doesn't uh, respect much the press. That's what many people say. No, I agree with you that I don't think he does respect the press very much, um, and uh, I think this is, you know, this is a fact. Um, I think he was had a bruising experience in the 1989 election. Mm -hmm when um, he uh, was holding quite large street and public meetings uh, around the country, and he was totally ignored by the big media. And I can't remember, there was a particular incident which sort of cracked that open. At, at a certain point, they had to start reporting him, and, and so at that point he became um, uh, publicly known. But his relationship with the media has been very complicated. I mean, um, he was created almost overnight a national icon in the late 70s when he was leading these strikes in Sao Paulo. And because it chimed with people's exhaustion with the military regime, and the exhaustion by ordinary journalists as well as the owners of the uh, media, he was suddenly the great hero. And, um, uh, this, in a sense, the media invested in, in Lula at that point. Um, they then, as, I, as we were saying, sort of tried to uh, draw the rug from under him uh, uh, later on, and he himself has never really got onto a, a proper relationship. And I agree with Rogério that he is one of those people who would, um, and it's almost a Latin American failing, not just a Brazilian um, thing, that likes to go onto a public balcony and address the adoring masses rather than expose himself to the awkward questions of journalists who may know a lot more about a particular topic than he does. Um, one of the things about Lula, too, is um, he's very good in sort of small rooms, you know, with a small group of people um, uh, talking to, responding, manipulating. Very good with the, the, the big masses. But um, there are areas where he isn't very good. And one of his weaknesses, in a way, is that he always likes zooming around. He likes, likes to be traveling but either within Brazil or around the world. I think it's this week or next week he's in Mozambique again, <laughs> for example. He's, he's in Madrid, Madrid today. Uh, He'll be in uh, uh, New Delhi tomorrow and then Maputo. In a few days. We love it. We love it. I mean, you know, if, if, if a chap, I mean, I, I don't know whether he's going to end up like Tony Blair. If you compare the photographs of Tony Blair in 1997 with when he finally stopped being prime minister, and if you think of all the air miles he'd traveled and all the time zones he'd crossed, it's hardly surprising that he looks like a kind of wreck. Um, and even Lula, who's got a very strong constitution, it's one of his great assets, you know, is, is not going to benefit. But the net result of all this zooming around is that he actually hasn't got a sort of total grip on a lot of things. And so it would be very easy for a journalist in a, uh, in a small press conference to shoot him down, uh, and he would look a complete idiot. Um, and indeed, he, at various crisis points in his period as president, he has looked a complete idiot. 
uh, most notably when the corruption crisis in 2005 was at its height. Um, and he was all over the place, you know, uh, saying nothing to do with him, or he was Jesus Christ, or, you know, was, or uh, completely bizarre sort of responses, and certainly not a kind of um, considered um, a systemic response. Uh, during the um, election, he said he was going to make a contribution to cleaning up the system. <laughs> I have yet to see it. <laughs> Just one last question before I, 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 I pass to other people. Uh, you, you say something here in, in the book that many people would just say, hmm, do you think so? That Lula and Fernando Henrique Cardoso, the previous president, could actually be just part of the same package for presidential terms, kind of social democratic, but with links with the most conservative, you know, uh, 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 groups in Brazil, and basically having a very similar uh, or the same economic uh, uh, um, policies. Uh, do you think that, in a way, uh, Brazil has been having pretty much the same government since Cardoso uh, uh, came to power uh, in '94? Well, not exactly the same government, no. I mean, there's no doubt at all that Lula put a stop to privatizations. Uh, he started using the uh, development bank, BNDES, uh, for um, development projects inside Brazil and for linkages with other Latin American countries. Um, many of his international policies, the sort of South-South policies, these were not things that um, Fernando Henrique Cardoso uh, went for. But I do argue that the pair of them should be considered as products, slightly different products, of the anti-dictatorship um, campaign. And products, slightly different products, in um, a package that helped uh, Brazilian democracy to get firmer roots. We've discussed some of the weaknesses of Brazilian democracy already. Uh, but um, if you compare it, you know, with how it was in the 1980s, both economically and in terms of the social programs, uh, in terms of Brazil's status in the world, I think one a, a, a historian looking back in 20 years' time will say that the fact that each of them served for two terms, uh, that there were continuities, I mean, particularly in... Um, uh, in economic policy, there's a, a, a kind of failed continuity. One of uh, uh, Lula's greatest failings, and indeed one of Cardoso's greatest failings, although he was a professor and it was one of his campaign slogans, has been in the field of public education. When you compare Brazil with other countries at a similar stage of development, GNP per head, etc., etc., one of the really glaring weaknesses of Brazil is its public education system. And so I think, you know, in their successes and in their failures, they were not that dissimilar. But they were, they were different. But I think it was a sort of particular generation. Um, they came from very different parts of the social spectrum. Um, and, uh, you know, their own attitudes are not alike. Uh, they did briefly collaborate in the campaign against the dictatorship, but they then took different directions. Lula was deeply skeptical of the real, the, the new currency that um, Cardoso introduced before he became president, uh, and yet it was a success. It was one of the great errors of judgment of the PT. Um, and uh, it was, uh, as I say, looking back, I'm, I'm quite sure in, in 20 years' time, people will say that you have to see them as a sort of a package. They weren't the same, but it was a kind of a package which helped to give Brazilian democracy a firmer, it's still insecure, but a firmer position. Thanks, Richard. Go on to any questions? Hello, Richard. Hello, Roger. Hello. I'm Jan Rocha. I used to be the BBC correspondent in Brazil. And I'd just like to make a few comments. Um, I was covering the ABC strikes in the late 70s when Lula came to power. And I think one aspect which is very important of Lula was his incredible charisma. 
And if you were there and you saw him talking to these huge crowds of people, people standing there in rapt attention watching him, he was an incredibly, and still is, a very charismatic person. Mm. Uh, another thing, talking about his motivation, um, I think he was also, I think he's also always been a man with a certain mission. Mm. I mean, I can remember once when we invited him to talk to the foreign press in, in Sao Paulo in 79. For some reason, we had this meeting at the British, the English club, which is a rather sort of um, <laughs> high class place in the center of Sao Paulo. Anyway, we took Lula there. And obviously, he'd never been there before. And it was rather a rather posh club full of tennis courts and bowling green. And I always remember Lula stopping as so we climbed up some stairs and looking down on all these tennis courts and saying, one day, I want workers' children to be able to play tennis here. Mm -hmm. So he, he always he knew that he, from a, you, you might question his lack of a sort of ideological basis or where exactly he came from. But I think he's always been very clear. He wanted to give Brazilians a better life. Yes. And he always refers back to his own poverty-stricken childhood in the Northeast. And he gets tremendous satisfaction nowadays from going around, talking to huge crowds who are getting Bolsa Familia, so uh, grateful to Lula because of that. Um, and he really loves that. The other thing I just wanted to comment on was talking about um, class, working class, and so on, talking about the PT. I think one should remember that before the PT, there was the PTB, the Brazilian Workers' Party, which began during the Getulio Vargas time. And although, obviously, the, there wasn't such a big industrial working class in the ABC, I mean, it sort of began in the late 50s, but you did have big groups of industrial workers in Rio, had the Petrobras the oil workers, you had railway workers in Rio Grande do Sul. So there was a sort of workers' movement which dated from about the 1940s. And, with, and uh, like the Communist Party, didn't exactly love the appearance of the PT. I mean, Brizola was one of Lula's fiercest enemies. Brizola was the head of the PTB. So, but there certainly was a working class movement before the PT. That's, that's what I wanted to say. Uh, so I'm so glad you're here, John. Um, I think on the first point, there's no doubting at all of his commitment, his very, very deep commitment um, to the improvement of the life of, of, of ordinary Brazilians. I think that's unquestioned, and he's tried to protect, you know, maintain that as, as the years have gone on. Hello. Um, I wanted to ask about the corruption crisis of 2005. How did Lula come relatively unscathed out of that? I mean, from the news coverage here in Europe, it seems that uh, the line generally was that um, other people in the party would say that Lula had no involvement in it. He had no knowledge of it. Um, is that it, or was there something more to it? Well, Rogério may well wish to come in. Um, my own sort of assessment is um, it was very difficult to get to the bottom of how much Lula did or did not know. Um, as I've sort of implied, he was never a great man for detail, not a man for sort of checking the minutes. But I think um, he knew how the Brazilian system worked. It, it, the, one of the people I interviewed and who I quote in this book said, uh, in the beginning, the uh, PT was opposed to the establishment. It then negotiated with the establishment. It then became part of the establishment. And in an awful way, there's quite a lot of truth in that. Um, I think that uh, the um, uh, sort of fixing of the alliances, as, as I explained, Lula didn't really have a majority. The Pete didn't have a majority in Congress when he was elected as president. And so this meant that although a president can do a lot in Brazil, um, if you want legislation, you know, you've got to get support. And um, uh, people worked on his behalf to get support, and they did it in a corrupt way. I mean, there were other types of corruption as well. But um, that was uh, fairly um, important. Now, how did Lula get away with it? it it's a very, very interesting question. I think 
on the one hand, the opposition, which was chiefly the Pairs de Bay, reckoned he was going to lose anyway. Now, in, in Brazil, as Rogério has reminded us, um, opinions can change quite rapidly. Um, so, you know, it looked as though he was going to beat Cardoso. In fact, Cardoso won. It looked earlier as though he would beat Collor de Mello. In fact, Collor de, de Mello won. Um, uh, and in 2005, some of the people in the Pairs de Bay said, well, let Lula just hang himself. Let this just run on, and we'll win anyway. And uh, we don't need to worry. There were other people in the Pairs de Bay who said, well, actually, we've been done this sort of uh, uh, number two, uh, Kaisha Doyce kind of black money kind of operation. We, all, we, if this thing really explodes, we're as much in the firing line as the as the government. Um, so there was that kind of feeling. Um, with the public at large, I think there were different sort of attitudes amongst the sort of old petistas. They said, "Oh, this is all being got up by the press. This is the usual attack by the right wing press on a left wing workers president." So they kind of wrote it out in that way. Other people said, oh, well, it'll all end in pizza. This is the usual thing, you know, uh, politicians will find a way of sort of dealing with it. And, and it, there's nothing different here. This is the usual story of Brazilian politics, politics as a business. So they um, discounted it. And it was very odd that, that by sort of early 2006, with an election due in the late in the year, he was beginning to sort of pop up in the opinion polls. And it wasn't as though there'd been some striking thing like Gordon Brown suddenly riding to the rescue of the British economy, having been madly unpopular. There was nothing quite as dramatic as that in Brazil. It was a more gradual thing. And I think the other thing that one shouldn't underestimate is the sort of sheer staying power of Lula. He'd been around a hell of a long time. He'd visited a lot of small towns. Many people had actually touched him, had taken part in these events that um, Jan was referring to, had been at the back of the crowd when, you know, 10,000 people were there. And gradually that sort of came back up. And then, you know, his opponent was not a very brilliant man uh, when it come the day in 2006. But even so, he was forced into a second uh, round, which had not happened to Cardoso. Uh, and um, so, you know, but Rogério may also have a view on how he rode out the crisis. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's quite funny with uh, uh, Lula. Lula has become, throughout the years, uh, uh, such a strong and unique, uh, unique political figure that um, his association with the Workers' Party for many people in Brazil, especially in the Northeast, this is something that they don't care. Lula is Lula. We don't even remember, you know, w which party he belongs to. So if he comes to the, to the television and says, uh, you know, I have nothing to do with this, and people just say, okay, we believe him. Uh, he, he really managed to put himself in such a strong position and kind of protect himself from uh, uh, um, the, the mistakes that his party was doing, which was in a way, you know, uh, uh, mistakes that the Workers' Party made, uh, even if Lula didn't know anything about that, it was actually to, uh, to make it possible to, for Lula to become president. It was, you know, it was part of a whole plan to, to make that election campaign possible. Uh, so if Brazil had perhaps stronger institutions and if, if you know, if polit uh, party politics was something that is, was stronger in Brazil uh, and, and if we had like, you know, a 200-year-old democracy, which is not the case, uh, perhaps Lula would have suffered m more than that. But, but as, as Richard uh, rightly said, Lula had to go to a second round, which was in fact due perhaps uh, 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 more uh, to the fact that he didn't go to a debate in global television and the whole country expected him to come to the debate and debate uh, uh, the issue of the corruption. He decided not to go to the debate, uh, something that the electorate decided to pu punish him for, and, and, and he had to go to the second round. And, and it's funny that Lula is, as I said in the beginning, is the most popular president that Brazil has ever had. but. He never won in the first round. 
in, in, in the, the first time he, you know, he, he had to go to the second round every time. And, and Fernando Henrique Cardoso won both elections in the first round against Lula. So uh, Cardoso did much better than Lula in the elections themselves. So uh, Lula, suf Lula suffered a bit. And, uh, uh, but perhaps because he's so unique, he managed to protect himself from the party and distance himself, especially for the poorer people, those who really believe in, 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 in personal politics, which is, you know, the, the Brazil is basically a, about personal politics. Good evening. I just want to ask uh, to Richard, what do you think about, um, it was very interesting the comment that um, you did about uh, the legacy of Lula. Uh, and you mentioned also the concept of personalization in Latin American politics, like this important figure more than the party. What is going to happen with his legacy about uh, in politics in, in Brazil in 5, 10, 15 years? What is going to happen with, with the, I don't know, with the political atmosphere after, if he's going to be like the leader or after him, what is going to happen? Well, it's very difficult to forecast because there are so, there are many unknowns. But I think it's interesting to compare him with a previous figure, but also, I also wrote a biography of him, Getulio Vargas, who's, um, who did have a very active legacy after he committed suicide. He had founded two parties, rather different, the PTB, as Joan Rocha was referring to, a sort of workers, but a rather top-down workers uh, party, and the PSD, rather, which was a more conservative, middle-of-the-road kind of party, the party of Jusulino Kubitschek, the man who built Brasilia. Now, um, that legacy continued uh, for about 15 years after um, uh, Vargas's death until the uh, military takeover, the Golpe, in 1964. And it was still, you know, you were either pro or anti Vargas. It was still a defining part of, of Brazilian politics. And that was a more restricted electorate, a more restricted democracy than we have today. If um, Lula completes his term, as I hope he does, um, uh, uh, somebody else will run uh, with the support of Lula and uh, probably the coalition that supported Lula. It may not be a PT person, it may be from one of the other parties, the PSEB or, or uh, uh, some uh, other person, but will have the, the sort of magic of Lula attached to him or her. Um, and uh, I think that will still be um, a, a significant factor. In terms of, of sort of um, politics and in terms of the sort of um, policy and strategy for Brazil in the future, um, I think that uh, what um, uh, Lula will have done is to, to sort of mark out a more socially uh, inclusive uh, Brazil than was known earlier, certainly during the military dictate and again during the economic disasters of the 1980s and the, the um, uh, 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 Cardoso party a, a period in the 1990s. I think probably that will stick, though it's very difficult to, to say for sure. I think that Brazil is a great power, which many parties have, have actually, and the, the military in particular, have backed and goes back to Vargas and, and the uh, pos positivists who created the republic. Uh, I think, you know, a member of the Security Council, um, the, the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, all of that kind of stuff, uh, I think most of that is going to stick. It's, it's a long... And there are some downsides of that, of course, because if you are rushing around um, being um, a, a big power, uh, your neighbors in um, South America in particular uh, don't like that very much and um, find these things uh, a bit annoying. And indeed, one of the very interesting developments over the last two or three years have been the growth of frictions between left nationalist uh, regimes in Bolivia, in Paraguay, and a little bit in, in uh, Venezuela also with Brazil, because Brazil is just very powerful, uh, and these can create uh, tensions and difficulties. So 
Going back to the Lula legacy, a bit difficult to tell. Um, as I say, I would credit him with um, assisting the democratization and, and the confirming of democracy. There are a lot of things going on around the side in Brazil that, that one I don't treat in my book. And um, uh, there's a very good new book also published by the same publisher, Zed, uh, called Throes of Democracy, which deals with some of these other cultural uh, and other issues which in my book I, I, I don't deal with. Um, so there's some interesting things going on which, which reflect a more plural uh, society, uh, more self-confident in some ways, but then there are some serious downsides. I mean, I think um, uh, two downsides which we haven't touched on so far this evening. One is, is the whole sort of crime lords, drug uh, trafficking, the sort of, you know, the, the films that you see coming to, to London. Um, I mean, this is a very serious issue. Uh, when um, uh, Lula was a little child growing up in slums himself, it wasn't really quite like that at all. And now this is a very serious issue so that uh, just prior to the last presidential election, there was a question of whether there was going to be a, a sort of a civil war with criminal gangs taking over Sao Paulo state. I mean, you know, really horrific for some of the people involved in that. Uh, and then on the environment, where uh, Lula, uh, as in some of his other policies, has tried to ride two horses at once. Uh, on the one hand, uh, defending the environment, defending um, uh, the forested area, etc. On the other hand, uh, hand in glove with uh, Blair Umagi, the, the big soya king in Mato Grosso, uh, into agro-business, agro-business exports, seeing this is very important for Brazil. Um, uh, and, and those kind of dichotomies. Um, you know, somebody who comes after him is going to have to uh, take a sterner view, in my opinion. But I don't know. Yeah, just, just, just quickly, if I may, I, I think that uh, if you think of Lula's legacy, I think perhaps his biggest test will be in 2010 to see whether he's going to make the successor or not. Yeah. Because that, you know, because for Lula to be who he is to address the crowd and 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 because the Brazilian economy has been doing well in the past few years uh, it's we can easily say that it's something you know it's easy for him to do but for him to transfer his support to someone else it's not that easy that is being shown for example in the very important uh, uh, election for mayor of Sao Paulo which the workers party might lose he's been working hard trying to elect Marta Suplicy the former mayor but um, but she's behind 10, 15 points in the polls, and uh, regardless what Lula does, mm. and Lula, you know, he, he may have 70 percent of the uh, 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 the people in Brazil behind him, but he cannot transfer that support to Marta Suplicy in São Paulo, and uh, um, so it would be very interesting to see whether he he, he managed to do that. And Dilma Rousseff, who may be the candidate for the Workers' Party. Uh, he's got a good, she's got a good chance because she's very respected by many people as a very competent uh, uh, minister. Uh, but I, I just I just quickly saying, you know, the the poorest areas in in, in Brazil, in the no, in northeast, uh, especially uh, people that they are actually very uh, 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 practical people and quite conservative as well. They voted uh, for Collor de Mello, who was opposition as well to you know to the government of José Sarney as much as Lula uh, because the situation in Brazil was dreadful in the late 80s and Collor de Mello was uh, uh, a popular figure saying that he would you know change everything Lula was saying the same thing and Collor de Mello uh, eventually won and then they voted for Cardozo who was uh, you know a sociologist from Sao Paulo from the upper class in Sao Paulo um, in 94 because the situation improved and Cardozo had brought the plan, the, the real plan as a minister, so they voted for Cardozo once and they voted for Cardozo again because this, that situation was still quite good. And they voted for Lula because the situation eventually got worse at the end of, of Cardozo's uh, uh, presidency. Then they voted for Lula just because that situation was good in 2006. So very pra practical. They vote for, for them who made their lives uh, make their lives better. Uh, this idea that Lula I I wins elections because he's the face of the Brazilian people, he has always been the face of the Brazilian people, but he lost in 1890, he lost in 94, he lost in, 90 in 98. He won elections because 
either the government, the previous government, was doing badly and they decided to give him a chance, and he wrote the letter for the Brazilian people in which he renegated all the radical positions that PT had previously, uh, previously defended. So he positioned himself in a more conservative platform. That's what I'm saying. You know, people, poor people in Brazil are conservative and are uh, a very practical people. So uh, they they vote basically thinking of their pockets. If they're doing well, they support the government. If they're not, they choose someone in a more in a more conservative basis. I don't know if you agree with that. But. Oh, you said earlier that um, well, you mentioned the idea of liberal economics going out of fashion. I wondered if you could speak a little about Lula's own personal beliefs about the economy of Brazil, his, his plans for that, and whether uh, his ability to implement his own personal ideas might change uh, in the, the current climate in you know, other countries, things like nationalizations of banks and these kind of things happening. Well, I, I'm going to pass over to Rogério on this because uh, he keeps his finger absolutely on the pulse in terms of, of current Brazilian government strategy facing the um, uh, banking crisis, and I, I, I'm sure he'll be able to fill you in on that. In terms of um, uh, Lula's um, own sort of economic commitments and policies, they've gone through some fairly radical changes. I mean, back in 1989, he wanted Brazil to renounce the debt. He made it absolutely clear in his letter to the Brazilian people prior to the election in 2002 that Brazil would honor all its obligations. And indeed, he made a tremendous fuss a year or two back when Brazil finally paid off its IMF or World Bank debts and said, look, you know, we are completely clean and we're, we're a sovereign nation again, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think um, his own, you know, his own um, uh, uh, personal economic policy is a little bit erratic. I mean, you know, obviously he started out with um, very leftist kind of um, instincts and commitments, and he would have happily nationalized everything at the drop of a hat. Um, but I think with the passage of time, that changed, even before the, the radical change that Rogério has mentioned with the letter to the Brazilian people. I think that, um, however, he has been much more positive uh, than his predecessor, Cardoso, about using state funds for development purposes, whether that's building a big um, uh, canal in the Northeast or uh, there are other things that he's done, uh, he, which he, he's sought to use state funds for developmental pur purposes, which has quite a long Brazilian history, but had been rather abandoned by the liberal economics of Cardoso. Um, as we've discussed, he's, he's put money into some social programs. Um, there are some social programs in Brazil that are very distorted. I mean, the most um, scandalous, really, is the whole sort of pension system, which gives a lot of money to retired judges and generals <laughs> and civil servants and isn't terribly kind to the bulk of the population. Uh, and at various attempts, including his own, to do something about that. Have, have run up against vested interests, including some of the people in his own party. So um, I, I would uh, say that he's, um, he's not been madly effective. And at the, at the more sort of um, microeconomic level, you know, he's uh, been, he's left the uh, management of the economy. His finance ministers have been conservative people. Uh, and um, and that paid off in a funny way up until uh, a month or two back in that money was flowing into Brazil. The, um, it's remarkable, even in the time I've been, in the recent times I've been going to Brazil, how much harder the Brazilian real is as against the pound sterling or the US dollar. Uh, it's, um, it's benefited from riding the commodities boom um, there have been, I think, some failures uh, of sort of industrial policy. There's a, in a, a weird way, Brazil is sort of going back to, to some of the old, you know, you depended on coffee or you depended on gold, you know, depending which bit of Brazilian history you're looking at. Um, now, of course, there's a, a, a range of commodities, but the industrial sector, um, uh, which, from which he grew, really, with the um, car workers and so on, is not in a terribly good way. And I would argue that sort of IT and software and all the things that um, 
uh, countries like India have been uh, benefiting from in a big way, and actually China too, uh, perhaps not as good in Brazil as they should be. But Rogério may well have a view, particularly on the very recent um, times. Uh, well, uh, Brazil has been doing quite well in, in the past few, few years, and uh, I think I mentioned here that uh, Lula in the, in the late 90s was probably seen as the unluckiest uh, political figure of Brazilian history, but then he became the luckiest <laughs> uh, uh, as, as president because basically he inherited a plan that he opposed from the very beginning, that he did everything that he could to stop, and then he inherited that plan, and he was forced into, you know, keeping that plan, well, you know, admitting that the plan was good and, and, and the, the, the currency had to be kept. Um, and basically him embraced the idea, the political idea, the economic ideas from Cardoso years, and he had the, the, the luxury of the, of the time and the situation allowed him to improve that. So basically uh, what, what happened, to, what has been happening in Lula's government is that that has been improved. The first two years were very, very difficult. Uh, economy in Brazil until 2004 and, and, and was very, 2003, 2004, ter terrible years. Um, but then he just became very lucky because of China. The, the demand for uh, uh, commodities from Brazil just made, you know, the countryside of Brazil the wealthiest area, the wealthiest part of Brazil. Uh, and then uh, uh, for many reasons, Brazil, mainly the exports of commodities, Brazil had this boom in, in, in the past few years. And then Lula being, uh, again, uh, uh, very lucky and um, because of the, the kind of uh, uh, Brazil that he inherited, Brazil is doing, well, Brazil is, is more protected in his in its uh, uh, bank system, the financial system, because in the 1990s there was Proer, which was a plan to to uh, sort the banking system, which was almost collapsing in Brazil. And it was I can't remember the figures, but it was a huge amount of money that the government put into the banks. The Cardoso government, I think, was that was 96, I guess. Uh, and Lula, of course, at the time was completely against it. And he was, you know, just shouting, "This is money for the bankers. This is money for the banks." But if we hadn't had that, uh, the, the bank, the Brazilian banking system, which would be in a much more fragile situation today. And so he's lucky because he's presiding over a, a, a country that has the system, which had a bad a, a period in the 90s, but now it's in a much better shape. So uh, Brazil will probably face difficult times because of the current crisis, but not as difficult as, well, nothing compared to, you know, what, what, what people here in the, Britain and the U.S. Will, will face. It's much more protected than it was uh, uh, in the Asian crisis, 97, and the Russian crisis, 98. Yeah. Actually, I think that pretty much answered what my question would have been as well, so. Thank you. Um, I know that it's a very risky business to forecast elections. You mentioned that possibly uh, it's going to be a coalition candidate rather than a man or woman from the PT ranks. Um, a lot of people were looking at the October election as a, an important development because had the PT done extremely well, then the conclusion was the candidate has to come out from the PT. But the fact is the result was very mixed. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, Sao Paulo didn't go to the PT. Still, still could go, I think, there is a runoff on the 23rd of October. So, um, and obviously looking at the pragmatic approach of Lula through all those years, is, is obvious that a lot of people consider the possibility of a coalition candidate not necessarily coming from the PT ranks, but endorsed by Lula. And, and then I just would like you to comment on, on this um, possibility, and if you could th through, uh, throw three, two or three names of who you think that may, may be the possible candidate in, for this election. Uh, and the second question I had and is, um, is about uh, the ability of Lula to project Brazil in Latin America, 
Obviously, we have two different leaders. We have Chavez, who has a different approach, a very open anti-US rhetoric. We have taken him no, nowhere, while Lula, by being more kind of pragmatic, at least in two serious crises in Latin America, um, the attack of Colombia within Ecuador against the FARC was a serious, a serious crisis, and Lula played an important role brokering a peace agreement there. And more recently in, in Bolivia, again, the country was quite close to a civil war, and once more Lula, in a very silent way, uh, played an important role. So without making noises about anti-US, et cetera, et cetera, in the two critical moments in Latin America over the last six months, Lula has delivered and has delivered well. So I would like you to comment on that in, and, and the ability of him to really make Brazil the, the regional leader that the country aspire, aspire to, to be in the future. Well, I'm sure Rogério will come in also. But I think, um, if I may deal with the second point first, um, there is no doubt there's a whole Brazilian political tradition of accommodation, um, which is quite different from anything in Spanish America, and actually quite different, I think, from Anglo-Saxon political traditions. Um, it, uh, it's deep in the social history of Brazil, uh, the sort of familial uh, and cultural histories of Brazil. Um, and there's no doubt at all that um, uh, Lula, who started out, it's important to remember that he learnt his skills. We've talked about his skills before a big crowd. But there's also, uh, for a trade union negotiator, um, the skill of um, a small group where you're negotiating sometimes to achieve a common front amongst your fellow unionists and then, of course, to try and cut a deal with the employer. I've always said, you know, this is so completely different from the tradition of military conspiracy from which Chavez comes, for example. But Lula, because of this rather special uh, union background that he has, uh, enjoys more than many Brazilian politicians this kind of skill for looking for compromise, uh, for finding a way of empathizing with the person on the other side of the table, and looking for a way through even in what seems an intractable problem. And so the two um, uh, cases you quote from South America, from outside the Brazilian border, I think display Lula's skills at their best. Very interesting to compare that with you know, the one thing that many people say in favor of Tony Blair, now that he's a historical figure in British politics, was his patience over the Northern Ireland negotiation. Now, um, I actually think that, that the Lula approach is actually quite different from the Blair approach. I mean, they both worked in the circumstances you've described. But I think it is, um, uh, and this is to Lula's credit, you know, he, he does have that kind of skill. And it doesn't always, it isn't necessarily uh, to gain great credit for himself, you know, in, in the cases you mentioned, um, you know, the credit was, was not so important for him, but, but he was making a contribution. Now, on the first issue of um, a leader uh, of a candidate who isn't perhaps Dilma Rousseff, um, I, uh, in my book, and I'm trying to find the, the relevant pages, but the, there was a sort of Perse Bay figure that I thought might be a runner. Um, I mean, it's very difficult, and it's a bit stupid of me to even mention names, really, uh, of who he might, uh, might back. Um, but um, uh, one of the uh, northeastern governors who then became an immensely successfully, uh, highly voted for um, uh, figure in the um, in the last election, and I can't even remember his name. It isn't a terrible confession to make, but I'm afraid I can't. Um, the other issue that has been raised is whether, if it looks as though uh, the Percy de Bay, the obvious uh, basis for the opposition, uh, is, is looking dangerous, whether he would again make overtures to this very popular figure, the governor of um, 
Minas Gerais, Ais Nevis, the grandson of Tancredo, um, who achieved something like 70% in the votes for um, uh, governor in the last election. And there clearly have been sort of noises and there are intermediaries at work. The usual sort of Brazilian pattern involves intermediaries. You know? uh, and uh, in the last election in 2006, there were um, committees for Lula and Aesu, which were sort of crossing all the theoretical boundaries because Aesu is a PSDB figure. But within the PSDB, which is not a madly democratic force, uh, there is a friction between the uh, Paulista wing and the, the Minas wing. And um, I think Mineros might well say, well, it's our turn to have uh, a go at this. You know, the Paulistas have been running the show for too long. And if they were um, beaten back, and if, as currently seems to be the possibility, Serra, the man who uh, Lula beat back in 2002, becomes again the Pes de Bay candidate, um, there might be a sort of breakaway. There might be a possibility for Lula to, to strike a deal with ISU. Uh, and, um, uh, and it's already clear, I think, in the way in which uh, Lula's looking at these second rounds, and there are many of them, that in, you know, he's, he's playing a bit fast and loose with the uh, Pete kind of um, uh, commitments in who he's maybe backing. They're not always Petistas. But Rogerio, again, may be more up-to-date on this. Uh, uh, for, regarding 2010, I, I think it would be, I don't know, it would be very difficult for, for PT not to have a, a candidate of, of their own. No, I think, you know, after eight years of Lula, after having reached the presidency, uh, although Lula has distanced him, uh, uh, himself from the party, the Workers' Party basically uh, uh, Think that you know they they are entitled to to have their own candidate and and, and now uh, Dilma Rousseff is is the strongest name for 2010 and uh, I think although Lula uh, struggles to transfer votes to uh, some of the candidates in this election the mayoral candidates I think when it comes to uh, uh, the national uh, uh, theatre perhaps he will be able to to do so um, so I. I I don't know. I think that would be very difficult for that to change. Uh, in in, in the, the question about uh, uh, foreign affairs, uh, I you know I think Lula's ability, as Richard was uh, uh, rightly saying, from the very early stages when he was a union leader, Lula's ability to dialogue and to you know to discuss and, and to negotiate. He's a great negotiator. Uh, but I think it helps that he's a, he's a great negotiator within Brazil and within Latin America, where his style of negotiation is very welcome. It's a very personal thing. You know, he can sit down and kind of chat with, with Chavez and, and chat with Morales and then chat with Correa and then chat with Uribe. He can chat with everyone and he can, you know, kind of uh, find ways of. Uh, 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 Reaching an agreement, and I think Bush liked President Bush liked Lula because of his straightforward way, kind of way. You know, forget about ideology. Let's you know, let's talk the two of us in a more straightforward way, which is not the way that is things are done. Let's say in the United Nations, for example, or, or, or WTO, or that you know other theaters. I think Lula thought that perhaps he could easily put Brazil in the uh, uh, um, Security Council of the United Nations. That and that is not something that he can do with his. You know, negotiation style that works in in Latin America. That's a different theater. Um, is there still a foreign debt? And given the behavior of foreign banks, might it be a good moment for Lula to finally um, denounce, we renounce it, to rescind it? Um, or is that so a past thing in Brazilian politics now? Uh, well, uh, Lula has uh, Lula announced very proudly, I think it was early last year, that Brazil doesn't have a, a, a foreign debt anymore. And, and Brazil is, uh, I think, at the moment, the United States is in debt with Brazil. 
uh, and, uh, and and Brazil has 200 billion dollars in foreign currency. So uh, that is a completely different situation. Lula is presiding in a completely different economic situation. So uh, what he used to say in the 1980s, in the, in the 90, early 1990s, wouldn't make any sense today in terms of you know uh, uh, financial situation of the country itself. I think the only other thing to say about that was that um, Argentina, of course, did renounce its debt, and uh, there was a period of um, uh, political turbulence, tremendous political turbulence, but more seriously, pauperization of very large parts of uh, Argentinian society. And I think, you know, Brazilians had kind of looked into the abyss and decided this was not a good idea, <laughs> and they should try yeah, and avoid But, but that. Brazil did re renounce the payment in 1980s yeah. uh, uh, under Sarney for, That's true. for yeah. a short yeah. period of time. Hi. Um, you mentioned about uh, Lula as being this very charismatic leader and Brazil as sort of being this um, big regional player. And I was wondering, I think that Chavez has, for different reasons, a very similar reputa uh, reputation um, in terms of his level of importance. And I was wondering, do you think that um, Lula and Chavez often sort of have a political conflict in terms of that position? Well, um, there certainly have been frictions. Um, I think one of the most embarrassing things for um, Lula was to be booed at the World Social Forum in Porto Alegre when um, Chavez was cheered. And uh, uh, that's now um, uh, about uh, four years ago. Um, and that was really because uh, people attending were gathering largely non-governmental civil society organizations, campaigners and radicals. Um, felt that uh, what um, Chavez was doing was much more radical and Lula had sold out. Um, I don't think that's quite fair on uh, Lula and maybe not an entirely good understanding of Chavez either. Um, but there have been some frictions. On the whole, uh, Lula and Chavez have managed to, um, uh, a, a, I mean, it goes back to the accommodating style as well as a sort of sense of leftism, uh, 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 some hostility to the sort of Washington hegemony, um, uh, but expressed rather differently. I mean, in the case of, um, in the case of uh, Brazil, I mean, you know, Brazil has sort of stood up against the Americans over oh, um, HIV AIDS campaigns uh, at one stage after 9-11 when all the uh, Brazilians were having to queue like mad in, uh, to get into um, airports in Washington and New York. Lula insisted that they, you know, there should be big queues. Uh, the Brazilians r responded in kind. Uh, and, you know, at that stage, the Americans dropped some of their <laughs> uh, things. So I think, um, uh, you know, the, the kind of uh, attitude vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. is a bit different. Um, as Rogério said, when Bush came to uh, Brasilia, you know, they chatted quite in quite a, a reasonable kind of way. And whereas um, uh, Lula has made it absolutely clear that he was going to kill the free trade area of the Americas, which was a keen uh, a Bush idea, and they've killed it. You know, it's it's that that's dead. Uh, but at the same time, he's been a bit careful with with um, uh, Chavez uh, when Chavez set up Telesur. This um, uh, television service for the whole of um, South America. Uh, Brazil wasn't really part of that and ran its own show. And you know, there've been there've been sort of bits of friction. The frictions have been greater, really, with the other states. I mean, there's been a huge row uh, with Ecuador over Odebrecht, a big Brazilian contractor, which allegedly messed up a hydro scheme. And anyhow, there's been a, a, a major row about that. There's been a major row with Bolivia over gas, uh, on which southern Brazil is heavily dependent. And um, during the, uh, it, it came to a peak when Morales was um, uh, imposing sanctions on Brazilian companies in the middle of uh, Lula's campaign for re-election. And Lula's um, chief of staff at the time uh, complained that this was a really dirty trick from a, you know, what was seen as a fellow uh, friendly government. So th there have been um, frictions, and I think this is to some degree inevitable given the disparities 
I mean, you know, Brazil itself is responsible for half the GDP of South America. Um, we're talking about um, uh, some quite different uh, orders of magnitude. At the same time, there have been some rather interesting developments. I mean, quite recently, uh, Lula and Cristina Kirchner, the um, Argentine president, signed a deal which allowed them to uh, build trade without using the dollar and just using the real and peso. And um, uh, plainly, this is a rather good move, especially, I think, in the present circumstances. But uh, Rogério may also have uh, comments. Uh, it's, it's clear that if, if it's one area, if there's one area uh, in which Lula was very different from Cardozo, who was in foreign, uh, foreign affairs, uh, uh, his foreign policy, and uh, like Richard rightly wrote in his book, is one of those areas that the you know kind of historical uh, people in, in in the Workers' Party they see, okay, well Lula did what he promised to do, and different from the economic. Uh, the, the economy when he, where he basically followed what Cardozo was doing, and uh, um, he, he has been trying to uh, to make Brazil to put Brazil closer to all these countries in Latin America. His uh, uh, foreign policy has been about these so-called South-South relationships or relationship with African countries, with uh, Arabic countries, with China. Um, and with in Latin America to be you know closer to these these people, Lula. I think Lula meets with Chavez almost every month. It, it's 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 fantastic. It's almost like you know as if they they are part of the same government sometimes because they they meet so uh, so often. And uh, so Lula really has this agenda. He wants Brazil to be welcome. He he wants Brazil to be closer to all this, this uh, to all these countries. Uh, so yes, there have been frictions, and, and he has been doing, I think, uh, all he can to, you know, to be closer to Chavez, but at the same time, to make sure that he's not embraced by Chavez's rhetoric against the U.S. And because Lula knows that he's that is not good for him, he wants to be seen. He doesn't say so, but he does want to be seen as the leader of that region when it comes to. United States uh, uh, and, and Europe. But the thing is, Brazil is seen by many people in South America, by many governments and companies in South America, as some kind of, uh, you know, a, a foreign power. That's why sometimes, especially in Ecuador, this, this crisis with Ecuador uh, in the past few weeks is quite serious. It's quite damaging for the relationship between the two countries. So it's, you know, it's, uh, it's one of those situations I think Lula loves that. It's just, you know, being put to the test and trying to. Uh, uh, negotiate with people and keep that in you know Brazil's influence but at the same time distancing himself is uh, uh, I think perhaps one of the areas that he feels most comfortable uh, 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 as, as, as president is dealing with these regional leaders hi um, as we're in a correspondence club tonight uh, I wondered if you'd uh, care to comment on the whole the Larry Rota affair, the New York Times drinking story, and what uh, your thoughts on that, what, what it said about uh, a different side of Lula's character? Yeah, well, I mean, um, uh, I, I, I'm not sat in with Lula drinking whiskey or so, I, I don't know, but clearly there's, there have been rumors that he has, at certain points, been a heavy drinker. There are also points where he sort of stopped drinking entirely. Um, though I don't think we've got that terrible effect on of the ex-drinker as we've seen with George W. Bush. I mean, there's not, nothing worse sometimes than the abstainer who has been a, uh, a heavy drinker earlier. Um, I think that the uh, Larry Rota thing also reflects what Rogerio was saying about Lula's distrust of, of the press. Um, and, you know, the, it was a wild sort of response to what was perhaps not a very good or terribly well-sourced story. Um, and I think that, um, uh, you know, how much uh, Lula drinks today, I honestly couldn't tell you. As I say, there have been times when he's sort of gone into training and lost quite a lot of weight and, you know, um, but there are also plainly times when, you know, he's been hitting 
no longer cachaca or beer, but, but whiskey, I think. Um, and I, I would think that, you know, aspects of his lifestyle are, are probably not very conducive to uh, total sort of sobriety. I mean, this business of Aero Lula, his own plane that zooms around the world, I'm sure there's a good, uh, you know, uh, kind of spirits cabinet in there somewhere. Um, and, you know, I think it's, as I say, I, I, I don't know enough to be able to say Lula drinks too heavily or drink, he's just a modest social drinker. I really don't know what the facts are. What I think is fair to say about Lula is that he does, he's a man who likes to relax, um, whether it's sort of watching a game of football or with his family and friends in Brasilia, and that I would be most surprised if drink was not part of that relaxation. But Rogério may have more up-to-date. The BBC has sources everywhere. <laughs> now, uh, the, 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 the problem with the, the Larry uh, Rotter affair was uh, you know, nothing to do with drinking or not drinking. It was actually the reaction uh, by the president uh, uh, against Larry Rotter. Larry Rotter, the correspondent for the New York Times in Brazil, after the story, they, he said that Lula was drinking too much. Uh, basically, uh, a few days later, it was uh, it was announced that his uh, uh, work permit would not be renewed in Brazil. Uh, and that was received by the press as something absolutely unbelievable. You know, it's like, how can Lula, how could Lula, the president, the democratic president, react in such a way against a journalist? And this is something that, you know, people from the press, journalists, reporters who have always been sympathetic to Lula, you know, Lula, uh, 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 perhaps the, the, uh, uh, the press, the media, the companies didn't like Lula much, but the journalists have always been very sympathetic and always liked Lula uh, and, uh, as a historical figure. And But that, it, it, was, it was a disaster in terms of his image as a democratic leader, democratic uh, president. Uh, uh, figure so he, he was probably very badly advised on that, or he was advised and he just made a decision that he said he thought it was was a decision, and uh, that is just like you know one of the aspects that shows that show that Lula uh, is a, a conservative figure in a, in a way he he reacts in a similar way that Color de Mello would react, or Getúlio Vargas would react, and Junior Quadros would react. So just like you know, it's a very uh, 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 he, f he thought he took that story as a personal thing and he couldn't separate his figures head of state and head of government from Lula the man so he was you know he was reacting against Larry Rota the man you know that his guy's not working in, in this country anymore uh, uh, which was you know Larry Rota eventually got his work permit he stayed there because it was terrible for the image of the government but it was one of those mistakes that I think Lula probably learned from that, but he just reacted in a way that just showed how conservative he is as a person, in a way, as, as a politician. Uh, uh, and uh, it was just a disaster in terms of uh, 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 PR uh, in Brazil at that time, and it was a time when Brazil was doing badly in the economy, so it was, it was a disaster. Thanks to Richard, thanks to Rogério, and thank you all very much for coming. And there's some books for sale, as you can see. Thank you.